Well, good morning, Walden Church. My name is David Kenny, and I'm the pastor here in Montgomery. And uh, just got a question for you. Have you ever gone to a concert, right? Some sort of performance, or maybe it was a ball game, and you sat down in your ticketed seat and then thought, I wonder who's sitting in those empty seats a little closer? Because right now there's nobody sitting in them. And maybe you wonder if those people are coming, or maybe you wonder if those tickets even got sold. I wonder if we could wait until the show starts, or maybe wait till halftime. And if those seats are still empty, we're gonna move down into those better, closer seats. What do you think? Can you relate to that? (laughs) Or how about, have you ever uh, driven down a street, maybe in your neighborhood, and thought to yourself, man, I wish I had a nice mailbox. I wish I had a golf cart. I wish I had a second story to my house. I wish I had a boat. I wish I could have some extra time this weekend. I could actually take my boat out. I sure would be nice to take more vacations. See, we see other people doing the things that we want to do or living the life that we think we want to live and we secretly wish we could move into the empty seats in front of us. Now, is something wrong with your life? No. Something wrong with your seats? No. I just wish I had better seats. (laughs) Whenever I wanted something new, My parents would tell me that I didn't need anything new and that I should be thankful for the things that I had. (laughs) Why? Well, because there's always starving children somewhere, right? (laughs) There was always this line, you should be thankful for the things you have because there are starving children in Africa. We've been talking about saying yes this month and I felt with Thanksgiving around the corner, Christmas around the corner, Maybe we could learn to say yes to being thankful. Last week, our men's ministry uh, read through the passage uh, in Philippians about Paul's time in jail, and I was reminded, you know, Paul was able to find joy even in prison. And by the time he writes Philippians, we sometimes think, well, he's he's just under house arrest, right? No, he's in Roman jail, and he's not... In a, in a cushy house anymore, just under a, a palace guard. The prison would have been underground. It would have been carved out of rock. So picture no light, rock walls. Literally, Paul's thrown into a hole. So it would smell like being underground. It would be a lot of dirt and stone lit by flame with very little ventilation, so the air would be thin, it would feel like smoke. In addition to all of that, he would have been chained to a wall, which should not be surprising, because Paul writes, for which I am an ambassador in chains, in Ephesians 6. Philippians 1, he says, it is right for me to feel this way about all of you, since I have you in my heart, and whether I am in chains or defending and confirming the gospel. So Paul's chains are not figurative. (laughs) They're literal. He's in literal chains. And this is the same place, this jail is the same place where Paul writes these words. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. So I was thinking with Christmas, Thanksgiving, right around the corner, we find ourselves kind of on the edge on the precipice of two of America's largest 
holiday celebrations, and I would say for as much as we think of them as being separate holidays, right, with separate uh, tradition, separate icons, they are both primarily about gratitude. Paul is in jail and he begins, Rejoice in the Lord always. A great verse to commit to memory, but we've got to remember the context. He's literally chained to a wall living in darkness. And Paul says he's living in the peace that surpasses all understanding. What a contrast. Where, where he might have reason to be tense and anxious and worry, he tells the Philippians... Do not be anxious about anything, but instead be thankful. And Paul's thankful heart had become so infectious that it spreads to others in the prison. And we know this because he writes, as a result, it has become clear throughout the whole palace guard and to everyone else that I am in chains, there's those chains again, for Christ. This is the time to complain. This is the time to bemoan and cry and throw a pity party to ask for help. Doesn't Paul realize this is it? This is the end of his life. In fact, the last five or six years of his life, he is spent in jail. And eventually he'll be beheaded. This is the guy who writes, Rejoice in the Lord always. And with thanksgiving, make your request known to God. How do you live such a life? This is Kane Tanaka. She died this last April, 2022. She was 119 years old, 107 days. And she is currently the second longest living person who has ever lived. And she died this year. Cain married her husband in 1922. Do you want to know how long ago 1922 was? That's when Warren G. Harding was president. And that year is the same year the White House got a radio. That's when she got married. <laughs> and she died this year. She had two sons, two daughters, and she adopted her niece. Cain's husband was later drafted into the military. He served from 1937 to 1939. One of her sons was captured at the end of World War II as a military POW. He was held in Siberia, being uh, released later and returned, returning home in 1947. After World War II, uh, she and her husband worked in their store, and it was around that time that she converted to Christianity because of one of the U.S. missionaries. Retiring from work at her store at 63, Kane traveled to the U.S. in the 70s to visit her relatives who lived in California and Colorado. Her husband died in 1993 at the age of 90. They were married 71 years. Now, you could say, wow, 119 years old, God must have blessed her with good life, good genes, right? Good DNA. When she was born, her parents didn't file the paperwork for a week because they were afraid she would die because she was born prematurely. So the birth date that's on her uh, birth certificate is a week later. Several years later, she received a major illness. She had a paratyphoid fever. She underwent pancreatic cancer surgery when she was 45. In 2006, Tanaka was diagnosed with colorectal cancer. She underwent surgery for that when she was 103. Her life and longevity were later recorded by her second son. He published a book about his mother called In Good Times and Bad Times. Ain't that the truth? In life, we are all faced with good times and bad times. And we think that the key to happiness is to live forever, to live as long as we can. But even a person who lives to 119 is going to face a lot more bad times than the rest of us. 
Paul is in one of those bad times. He's found a way, though, to sing a song of thankfulness. And I see these stories of people who live such long lives, and I wonder, well, okay, what causes them to live a long time? What, what, what attributes to longevity? It must be vitamins. It must be the fact that they're drinking their eight glasses of water a day. I don't know. But maybe it's not genes or DNA. You know, if you took all those things away, exercise, diet, and you looked a little closer, I wonder if we would see a person who had learned not to hold grudges, a person who had learned to let the small things go. I wonder if we would see people who had learned to say yes to being thankful. I bet doctors and medical studies would agree. They do. Research shows that grateful people are healthier people. People who display gratitude have 16% fewer physical symptoms, 10% less physical pain, 25% increased sleep quality. Gratitude improves psychological health, self-esteem, and mental resilience. Grateful people exercise more. Grateful people go to their checkups more. And both of those things contribute to longer life. Plus, studies show that just saying thank you and showing appreciation for things makes you a nicer person. <laughs> but the benefits don't end with nice words. Showing appreciation helps you meet new people and make new friends. Like Paul, people say yes to thankfulness. They learn to take those small and those large events and those blessings and to be thankful for all of it, the good times and the bad times. And while true, there are losses and disappointments and there's even tragedy in life, it's the ability to learn from those events rather than be destroyed by them that keeps us going. Now, do you need a doctor in a lab coat to tell you that things like thankfulness are good for you? No, of course not. Why? Well, because we've been reading those truths in the Bible our entire lives. Ephesians 4 says, Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ forgave you. 1 Thessalonians 5.18 says, Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. So, if we know this, then why don't we live this way? If this is how God wants us to live, how come we don't live this way? And how can Paul learn to be content even in chains? And how can he tell other people to rejoice while he's in chains? I'm over here grumpy, right? I'm over here grumpy because I still don't make six figures or because I don't have a two-story house or I don't have a third car or I don't have a new boat or a raise or a promotion. I still have to lose 10 more pounds. Why does my day get ruined when the waiter brings my food out cold? Is my life really that bad? Of course not. My life is great. My life is blessed. But it seems that no matter how great and blessed my life is, I still can't learn to live the way that Paul does. Instead, I grumble and I complain and I want better seats just like everybody else. It's not just you. Last week, we were reminded about the Israelites, right? The Israelites were slaves for over 400 years in Egypt and God freed them. And on their way to the promised land, they grumbled and complained about what? The food they had to eat every day, the beds they had to sleep on, and they complained and they said, ah, oh, I wish we were back in captivity where we got to eat whatever we wanted. Really? How ridiculous is that statement? God gave you freedom. Plus, they're not even hungry. They're not complaining because their tummies are empty. They're not hungry. They're just bored with the food that they eat every day. 
They didn't recognize there was blessing there. And they couldn't be thankful. Can you imagine uh, sitting down to a huge Thanksgiving feast prepared by other people, specifically for you, mountains of food that you didn't even lift a finger to make, more than any one person could ever eat, and you said, what? No green beans? Ugh. Thanksgiving is ruined. Or the child who receives toy after toy and gift after gift for Christmas, but they didn't receive that one video game. Mom and dad looked everywhere for it, but it was out of stock. And they just throw a temper tantrum and go off to their room. It seems preposterous, right? But do I have that same attitude? I, I say we should choose to say yes to being thankful about life. Because I bet you there is a high probability that any random person on this earth would happily choose to switch places with you in a heartbeat. Because let's face it, there are gonna be events that happen in life that we can't control, but the giving of thanks and being thankful will help us and those people around us. And so before Thanksgiving gets here, before Christmas gets here, let's try. Let's start right now and say yes to thankfulness. And I'm going to say it, okay? I'm going to say it. It starts with prayer. It starts with prayer. What we just read, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Think of it the same way as if you were going to prepare your Thanksgiving meal. All right? You're cooking the food. What do you need to do? Season it, right? You got to season it. If you don't apply the seasoning, there isn't going to be as much taste. And then we add the seasoning and it kicks the meal up a notch or two, right? And then it explodes with, with flavor and it creates a sensation in our mouth and people say, oh, this is so delicious, right? It's the same with prayer. It's the same. There is, there is a seasoning that God says we should add into our prayers and it's Thanksgiving. The Bible says that Thanksgiving is part of the recipe of a prayer. The one important ingredient that should flavor all of our prayers is thanksgiving. It's, it's as if God is saying, that's the thing that's going to kick your prayer into high gear. Every year I watch a lot of these Christmas movies, and there's always a few, there's always a handful that preach this message of, we should live in the spirit of Christmas every day, right? I say no, no, no. That's a hallmark attitude. I don't believe it. If you have to pick a holiday that you're going to carry the whole year through, you should be saying yes to Thanksgiving instead. Now, I'm going to get on my soapbox, okay, for just a minute. We live in an ungrateful world. We live in an ungrateful age. This is the era of entitlement, where thankfulness is no longer based upon what you have, but it's based upon what we think the world owes us. Mostly what we hear today is one complaint after another as people fail to get the things that they think they deserve. Our society is becoming more and more bitter, which I'm sure is a contributing factor to mental health and to crime. But I have to get down off my soapbox and examine my own heart. Am I a thankful person? I should be. Out of everyone in the world, right? Christians should be the most thankful. We should be the most grateful, right? Psalm 106 says, Praise the Lord, O give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, and his steadfast love endures forever. So you should say thank you when something good happens. You should say thank you when something nice happens to you. You should say thank you when somebody gives you a gift. You should say thank you when somebody holds the door open for you. No! No! The psalmist says, give thanks. Because why? Because God is good. That's why. 
because God is good. See, we've all been taught to say thank you after something good happens or you've been given something. But I don't think I've ever heard somebody say thank you when something bad happens. When was the last time your children said thank you when you disciplined them? Our thank yous usually come after blessing. And this is always true, even in God's blessings. But really, in reality, we should be thanking God at all times, in good times and bad. Just like the calendar year, what comes first? Thanksgiving comes first. Thanksgiving comes before Christmas. Thanksgiving comes before blessing, comes before gifts, not after. I think we need to live that way. And if we do, I think it'll revolution our life. It'll, it'll, it'll revolutionize our prayers. When our prayers come from a heart of thanksgiving and we become people that realize that God has the power to turn tragedy into triumph, that he has the power to turn mistakes into miracles, it's over. Forget about it. I'm thankful. I'm thankful because he is God. Second, Thankful hearts are humble hearts. Think about it. When are you the most thankful? Typically when something wonderful happens to you. Especially if, you, if it's unexpected. Right? It was unexpected. Most especially if you feel like you didn't deserve it. In other words, you are the most thankful when you are humble. Entitled, privileged people are not always thankful. Philippians 4 says, the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Are we thankful for the place where we live? No matter how bad that place might be, are we truly thankful for having food to eat? Or do we complain that ugh, steak night is only once a month? Are we truly thankful that we can get out of bed in the morning? Are we truly thankful that we can breathe? What, what I see are the people that are the most thankful for breath are the people who have trouble breathing. But it shouldn't be that way. It should be those who can breathe should be just as thankful. Right? If not more so. If you can walk without pain, if you can see without glasses, if your children are healthy, if your car runs, if there is a roof on your house, if there is food in your fridge, thankfulness sh shouldn't be just for the good stuff or for the holidays. It should be for the everyday stuff. It should be for the things that are even not so good. An entitled person says, well, I deserve to have all these things. But a humble person says, I am grateful to have all these things. Entitlement and privilege is us lifting ourselves up. That's a lot of work. It's a lot of effort to lift yourself up. But the Bible says, humble yourselves before the Lord and he will exalt you. First Peter says the same thing. Humble yourselves therefore under the mighty hand of God so that at the proper time he may exalt you. That's the good news. The good news is if we humble ourselves, if we humble ourselves, then God lifts us up. God lifts us up. There's no need to feel entitled. There's no need to be privileged. The world does not owe me anything because like Paul, everything I need, I get from God. I get from God so I can learn to be free. Be content uh, free, I can learn to be content in chains. Not to mention that the thankfulness and humility are the same attitudes that Jesus had, right? Paul says very famously in this same letter to the Philippian church, Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but he emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Jesus, Jesus humbled himself. He had every right to be entitled. He had every right to be privileged. He had every right to send his food back to the kitchen because it was cold. 
He had every right to name drop. He had every right to throw his weight around because he was God. He owned it all. And the Bible says nothing that has been made was made without him. And yet the Bible says that he was so humble that he gave his own life. Which brings us to our next point. Humble hearts are giving hearts. You know, the most generous people are not always the people you might think. They're not always the well-off. They're not always the rich, but rather those who maybe even have little to give. But they give in spite of their wealth. When Jesus visited the temple treasury, when he saw people dropping off their tithes and offerings, he noticed that there was a poor widow who had given the most. And while others put in vast sums, she put only two small coins in. In other words, she gave out of her poverty. She gave out of her lack. Not out of wealth, not out of excess. She gave at cost. Because when we give without cost, it leaves room for boasting. It leaves room for bragging. And it usually means I've left a little bit for my own security, right? But when we give sacrificially, something happens inside of us that brings us back to God's original design so that we are not conformed by this world, but rather we are transformed into the people that God intends us to be. Each time we give sacrificially, there is humility that comes into our hearts. Because when we give sacrificially, we realize that we are thankful for every good thing that comes down from above. Look at Paul's instruction to Timothy for the church. He says, as for the rich in this present age, charge them not to be haughty, nor to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but on God who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. They are to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous, and ready to share. Look at that. Giving goes right back to humbleness and thanksgiving, which means it's all connected. Humble people are thankful. Thankful people give. Why, why do thankful people give? Because thankful people realize it all comes back from God. Beside Revelation 21 says, And the twelve gates were twelve pearls, each of the gates made with a single pearl. And in heaven, the city of the streets was made with pure gold. The city streets are made with pure gold. There's pearls on the gates. What does that mean? It means all the treasures that you cling to on earth, they are building supplies in heaven. Gold is asphalt in heaven. It's concrete. When you hold on to these things, you think that the quality of your life goes up. But in reality, when you give those things away to help someone, or to improve their life, or to meet their need, or you give to the church, what it really does is it advances the kingdom of God on heaven on earth, right? On earth as it is in heaven. And look at what verse 19 adds, the very next verse. They are to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share, thus storing up treasure for themselves as a good foundation for the future so that they may take hold of that which is truly life. That sounds good, right? Giving and helping brings the giver what? Life. Paul says that the riches that we use to purchase life are really generosity and doing good. So we cannot just wait around for something good to be happen and, and then be thankful. We, we need to decide beforehand that we're going to be thankful, no matter what. Because thanksgiving comes first. 
In the calendar year, Thanksgiving comes before Christmas. It comes before gifts. It comes before blessing, not after. So you know what that tells me? It tells me that things like humility and thankfulness and giving, they are a choice. They're a choice. And saying yes to Thanksgiving is a choice that anyone can make. And so the greatest gift we can give this Christmas is a heart of thanksgiving. And I think that's why thanksgiving comes first. Hey, remember when I said that um, grateful people are healthier people, right? I'll show you that same slide. I said that 16% had fewer physical symptoms, 10% less physical pain, 25% increased sleep quality. Okay, let's test it. Put it to the test. Let's do it tonight. Let's start right now. Like I said, let's start right now. Let's not wait. Put it to the test. I want you to try keeping a five-minute gratitude journal by your bed. Piece of paper, binder paper, notebook, old TV guide, whatever, right? Back of your bulletin. Five minutes. I want you to write down the things that you're grateful for in bed, right before you fall asleep. This is what you're doing before you fall asleep. You're going to learn to Come on, flex those gratitude muscles. People who keep a gratitude journal, according to science, sleep better and longer. And there's more. They did a study of 96 Americans. They watched them for 11 weeks and they were instructed to, to do this. Keep a gratitude journal by your bed, write down you know, five minutes worth of things that you're grateful for. And those people ended up being people who exercised more and went to their doctor checkups more than the control group. Gratitude reduces feelings of envy. It reduces feelings that make us sad. It makes our memories about life, about our past, happier. So when we look back on our past, we're, we're happier about our past. It lets us experience quicker, faster, stronger feelings of joy so that when we experience a bad thing, we bounce back faster and we have less stress. Less stress. I think we all want that, right? So let's throw out the ne negativity this holiday season. Right now. It's gone. No more negativity going forward. We're going to be gra we're going to be gracious. <laughs> We're going to be thankful, and we're going to say yes to Thanksgiving. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you for your son once again, who was the greatest example of humility and giving. He set the bar. And where we may not ever obtain Jesus-level humbleness or Jesus-level giving, we also have Paul who even though he was in chains in jail, was able to say that he could rejoice and be thankful and that he could encourage others, even when he was in the worst place possible. When I look around at my home and my health, my family, I am not in the worst place possible. I am not in a cave in the dark, lit by torches, awaiting a death sentence. I have a wonderful life with many blessings all given to me by a loving Heavenly Father. Lord, may I be thankful and grateful for every good thing, not after Christmas, but before. Because you, you give life. You give life to all. And we are so grateful for it. Amen. Hey, we want to let you know about the Christmas season coming up. Uh, right now we're doing Operation Christmas Child. We're packing shoe boxes, ready to send them out. And then coming up after that, we'll be doing Project Angel Tree, buying gifts for uh, some children who need a little help this Christmas over at Maidley Ranch. And then of course, we'll be having our Christmas concert. We have a free Christmas concert here at the church. It's going to be on December 10th and the 11th. So kind of move your schedule around, try to find one of those nights where you can come and just uh, watch the choir and have an evening of worship and Christmas. And of course, we'll be doing Christmas messages all through Advent. We've got two services on Christmas Eve, one at 5 p.m. 
and one at 7 p.m. that are identical, and just kind of find the time that works the best for your family. And then Christmas Day is actually a Sunday. Christmas Day is actually a Sunday, and there will be no church services on Christmas Day. Please stay home and enjoy your family. Have a great holiday, and I will see you guys next week. Bye.